Yeah, there we go. See, I just got Astra, and I was able to kill Daniela that way. So, that's chapter 14. Um, I'll see you guys next time. Chapter 14 is one of the most annoying maps for this challenge. To start, the first entire half of the map consists of six groups of Cavalier that each get their own promoted Paladin, and four of them have access to 1-2 range. On top of that, the first half of the map has absolutely no walls or obstacles. It's a completely open field. In a normal playthrough, this wouldn't matter too much aside from generally being a boring map to go through, but for my purposes, it's a lot worse. The problem with coming up with a reliable clear where you also route the enemy for this map is the fact that since the Cavaliers are in groups, they'll all have overlapping ranges, as well as some of their movement being completely random. My strategy here tries to mitigate as much randomness as possible, but unfortunately there are still two turns where I have to rely on the enemies cooperating with me. Once you get far enough into the map, reinforcements will appear in the back half. This is also where our first and only main story capturable boss resides, being Daniela. For fun, I am going to try and capture her, but the fact that she's a strategist makes it very easy to accidentally overshoot when trying to kill her with an underleveled Orochi. Luckily, there are three dragon veins that conveniently drop her down to enough HP to where Orochi will be able to kill without any assistance. Before we start, we have some promoting to do. As I said in Chapter 13, I'm promoting Silas into a Paladin before he reaches level 16. Not only is the extra movement stat super useful for this map, but I also don't want him to gain too much of a higher internal level. I'm also promoting Kaden. This promotion is solely for the one extra point of movement and nothing else. He unfortunately just isn't a good enough unit to warrant training unpromoted for this challenge, so it's a good idea to get him a slight boost in power while he's here. Finally, I'm using the third heart seal of the run on Felicia. She'll be going into Hero, where she'll be able to get good fortune, stronger posts, and soul. Generally, this is not recommended to ever do, as Felicia really prefers to use her magic stat. But after she gets married, she isn't going to really get used. That's why all the resources that I am going to put into Felicia will solely be for Shiro. Part of that is giving him soul. Corrin pairs up with Silas, and then Silas goes in enemy range and drops him north while Mozu goes under him. This has put me in range of 5 enemies. One cavalier that will attack Silas on enemy phase, and two cavaliers and two paladins that will attack Corrin on enemy phase. Corrin is going to try and dodge tank 3 of the 5 hits he's about to take with the dual katana. This enemy phase will not kill Corrin or put him in any serious danger going forward if he gets hit by all of them, but it will activate Vow of Friendship, which will cause Silas to be too powerful in the later round. There's also a second issue with this setup, and unfortunately it's not something I can control. 
Since the whole map is an open field, there are two different spaces that the first paladin will choose to attack Corrin from, being the north and east of him. With the way things work out, I need the paladin to attack from the right side since I need the space above Corrin to be empty. Orochi and Kaden head towards the very bottom of enemy range to fight this outlaw. And Setsuna and Saizo head towards the other side to fight the other outlaw. Saizo also happens to be put in range of the paladin who will attack him on enemy phase. Interestingly, the cavaliers, despite being able to dual strike if they move forwards, won't move from their original spot. This is also the case with the outlaw on Orochi's side of things, which makes random enemy movement significant since Orochi can't double and kill like Setsuna can. Ryoma goes deep into enemy lines and drops Felicia down. This puts Ryoma in a ton of ranges, but he'll only be attacked by 3 knights and 1 cavalier. He's also body blocking for Felicia, who's only in range of the outlaw behind the knights. With the brass katana, Ryoma guarantees that Felicia will still gain some experience from this enemy phase. I should point out that if Silas did not kill this cavalier, Korn would not have to deal with random enemy movement. This would however cause other enemy movements to be important, so either way I'd have to take the random chance. No hard feelings. That was stressful, but luckily everything went the way I wanted it to. The next two turns are a lot more relaxed. Starting on the left side, Azama weakens the Paladin so Tsubaki can kill without having to take a counterattack. There's now only two cavaliers remaining in the bottom left group of enemies. 
I'm going to deal with them by having Saizo go in one of the ranges and healing himself, and Hana going in range of the other one. Hana is able to kill the Cavalier by herself if she holds a Steel Katana, so she won't have to rely on Azama's inaccurate hit rates. Saizo, on the other hand, is not able to kill even with the help from Setsuna and Rallying Cry. I'll have to kill it next round. This ends up working out in my favor though, since it allows me to get a combat with Setsuna and Hinoka adjacent together. If I end up trying to use Hinoka in the late game, having the option for the archer skills will help her out a lot. Likewise, this is also why I'm building support with Sakura and Hana. On the right, Ryoma moves above Korin to weaken the Paladin and move out of the space below the Outlaw. Fun fact, if Ryoma was unlucky enough to get hit by absolutely everything so far, including these Paladins, he would survive exactly on 1 HP. Thanks to Vantage, he's able to consistently survive the next two enemy phases if he switches to the Regento. Now that that's done, Korin goes above Felicia and uses her dual strike to kill the Outlaw so she can get a little more experience. I want to feed the Paladin that got weakened by Korin to Felicia. She has to rely on Ryoma's dual strike in order to do this, so Silas first weakens it with a javelin. This is why I couldn't let Korin activate Vow of Friendship, since that would just feed Silas the kill. Mozu kills the second paladin using Silas's dual strike. I want to say here that on a failed attempt of this map, I had forgotten to change Silas's weapon to the Brass Naginata. He ended up hitting anyways and got the most badass critical hit of all time. Orochi finishes off the outlaw that she fought last turn. Thank you. Due to the outlaw's random enemy movement, I had to account for this by making my strategy flexible to where she didn't have to move at all to reach Kaden on the next turn. So even though I just promoted Kaden for 6 movement, he only goes 5 spaces away from Orochi's position. Kaden, Orochi, Silas, and Mozu are going to spend this turn heading closer to the enemy group in the top right, while still staying outside of enemy ranges. Ryoma goes in range of the lone cavalier on the right, as well as one of the cavaliers from the group to his left. This will also pull the middle cavalier from this group towards him, since that enemy will dual strike for the others. For this enemy phase, I did give him a concoction in case he was unlucky enough to get hit by everything in the previous turns. Trouble. 
I'll just be here. I'm happy. Feels good. Most of this group is similarly going to barely go outside of range of the top left enemies. The only exception is Hana, who will be fighting the Cavalier that won't attack Ryomon enemy phase. This Cavalier will always choose to dual strike with the Paladin, and no matter where the Paladin dual strikes from, always leads to the same kill setup for Corrin, who will use this to reach level 20. To make enemy ranges easier to look at, I start by having Ryoma and Felicia get the last cavalier in the center dealt with, making sure that I give Felicia as many chances to attack as possible. For the Paladin near Hana, I first have Hana attack with the Kodachi without moving. Azama's dual strike here isn't required to hit. Sasuna moves up to let Saizo chip the Paladin with the Steel Shuriken. Poison Strike will do enough to let Korin land the killing blow. It is better if Korin uses the Kodachi here for experience, but considering how much uncertainty this clear has with random enemy movements, I decided it was better to not take my chances and just kill with the dual katana. Azama moves above Tsubaki to kill the ally that moved close to him. Azama one-shots here even if he trades with Tsubaki for the Brass Yumi. That said, it's overall better if Tsubaki keeps it for next turn. What I should have done was buy Azama his own unforged Brass Yumi to let Tsubaki dual strike and have better accuracy, but I was trying to be a little stingy with money here. Hinoka moves above Azama, and Tsubaki goes right next to her. This will lure the left group of Cavaliers, who conveniently always move in the exact same way with the setup I have. They won't be hard to deal with next turn.
Over here, Silas and Mozu took the outlaw down to 1 HP for Roshi to kill. This is the second reason why I couldn't afford to let Silas have Val of Friendship active. However, this one's a lot more easily preventable since Corrin is right next to Sakura in this turn. While Kaden could lure the top right group of Cavalier like Hinoka is doing, my units on this side are a lot weaker in both stats and numbers, so it's actually a bad idea to do so. Another problem with them is their movement is also completely random. My units here are too weak to fight the Cavaliers on their own, so I'm instead going to have them run away towards Ryoma. The first turn of random enemy movement doesn't seem to matter as much, but the second turn of enemy movement has so many different outcomes that I couldn't even make backups for them. There were three outcomes in particular that were what I wanted, and there were a lot more outcomes that I didn't want. As long as I get one of the three, I'm good. Once again, to clear out enemy ranges, I'll start this turn by dealing with the left side. Azama finishes off the Cavalier from last turn. My apologies. Saizo can now move forwards to attack the Paladin with the Steel Shuriken. Unfortunately, Azama's dual strike does have to hit here. Now that Saizo's in place, Sasuna can complete her part of this turn. Sakura finishes off the final Cavalier. She could kill the Paladin instead, but I'd rather feed that experience to Hinoka since she's a lot lower in experience. Thanks to the debuffs and Poison Strike that Saizo provided, Hinoka's barely able to meet the kill threshold to the Paladin with the Gardener Yanada. Like I said before, Mozu and Orochi pair up with Silas and Kaden respectively, and then retreat to let Ryoma handle it. Now, Ryoma with 15 HP is able to survive this enemy phase with exactly 1 HP, since only the Paladin will be able to attack him along with a weak dual strike. If I wanted, I could save the concoction here, but for consistency's sake, I'm going to use it anyways. We've got this. Korin has nothing to do this turn, so after moving further up, I have him take this time to promote into Hoshido Noble. He won't stay in this class for very long, I won't even get Dragon Ward on him, so don't get too used to seeing this class. Your 
and we actually got the enemy formation I was hoping for. Nice. I begin this turn by weakening the Paladin with Felicia. Something weird is that if Felicia were at low health here, the danger music would start playing despite the enemy not being able to counterattack. Ryoma chips the top right cavalier, mainly to move out of the way for Orochi. Orochi now goes to where Ryoma was, where she'll be able to kill the Paladin with Cadence Dual Strike. Hana weakens the bottom right Cavalier. This will allow Mozu to barely not kill with the Brass Naginata and let Felicia clean up with a dual strike. Silas kills the other weakened Cavalier. Of course, you have to go for the crit chance when it doesn't matter. Kanan cleans up the final Cavalier. The rest of my units may seem like they don't have anything to do, but I can do things to change that. To start, Sakura goes full right to the edge of her movement range. Saizo then pairs up with Azama to give him plus one movement. This allows him to reach Sakura and transfer Saizo to her. Now, Korin can move above Sakura to take Saizo, where he'll be able to have Saizo drop him in range with the Bolt Axe Berserker. Hinoka, Setsuna, and Tsubaki just stand by. Corrin takes the Armored Slayer from the convoy to begin killing the group of knights. Setsuna can now go where Corrin was to kill the Berserker. It's pretty annoying that Setsuna is one point of damage short of one-shotting, but it's technically better for experience. Saizo now moves a little forward to kill Benny. I 
I can milk the final knight for experience by having Tsubaki attack it before I kill it. After he does that, I'll feed the kill to Uzama. Sakura kills Charlotte. It may seem like a waste to feed it to her, but the fact that she is Gamble makes her far too dangerous to keep alive. For the next while, there's going to be a lot of slow placements on where the rest of my units will end up. That's mainly thanks to being really worried about messing up an input and having to do the first section all over again. Sorry. Fun fact, Azama is 3 up on his strength average and 3 down on his speed average. <laughs> Hana moves above Sakura to kill the fighter. As I read my notes while I'm playing, I will say that I was almost hoping that the enemy would hit here. Not for any tactical purposes, but because it would have been really, really funny. Ryoma pairs up with Korin, and Korin will go in range of the three fighters in the center room and two outlaw. This will allow them to unlock their C support on top of actually giving Ryoma a chance to use the Raijinto on this map, since they kill with a combination of the Kodachi on Korin and Raijinto on Ryoma. I'm not going to have Ryoma in the front though, since Korin is actually so bulky that he doesn't take damage at all from the outlaw and barely takes anything from the fighters, of course assuming they actually hit. Ryoma, you're supposed to crit. Dude. Now that the center is cleared, I can start working on the surrounding knights and generals in the hallway. Tsubaki will lure the leftmost one, and also carries up Saizo with him. Tsubaki is fine to use the bow here because the knight has a javelin, meaning that he can counterattack as long as he's at the very edge of his range. Hinoka goes directly in the center of the room to apply her personal aura to both sides, as well as dual strike with Tsubaki. Sakura also moves forward to apply her aura. Felicia pairs up with Ryoma, and then Ryoma will go in the knight on the right's enemy range, parallel to Tsubaki. 
Now, there is a problem with the setup that I have here, and that's the fact that I want Ryoma to dual strike with Corrin and not Felicia or Hinoka. Since Felicia doesn't have a fast support with Ryoma, she's already ruled out. However, since Corrin and Hinoka both have a fast support with Ryoma, and haven't gained any supports prior to this map with Ryoma, that means that whoever Ryoma chooses to attack with as a dual strike partner is down to a complete coin flip. How do I fix this? Well, there's actually more than one way. The first way is to simply move Hinoka to a different spot, which I could have done, but didn't. Because I preferred the second solution, which is an even better option of letting you know that I've been bullshitting you this entire time. You really thought that Ryoma couldn't handle an unpromoted knight by himself? Unbelievable. As this turn ends, I'm getting all of my units into positions to where they'll be set up to help out meaningfully for the next few turns. By this point in the map, I've basically already won. However, it wouldn't feel right to have a map like this devolve into an improvised disaster like it does in almost every one of the rest of my clears, where I simply do whatever I feel like at the very end of a mission. Here, I thought it was only right to finish this map out in style even if it did take a lot of double checking to make sure I was placing everyone correctly. Since Mozu and Silas aren't going to be much help against the promoted generals, I have Mozu kill the weakened knight that was left over to level up. Saizo weakens the general with the Sting Shuriken and Poison Strike. This will leave the general with 8 HP left on top of the debuffs from the shuriken, so killing it after this will be a very easy task. I move Kaden below the general so I can have Orochi kill him. Since the opportunity has presented itself, I want to try and capture Daniela. Before that, I want Orochi to gain as many stats as she can to help with reliability. The second general, since we don't have a Sting Shuriken Saizo for it anymore, requires a few more steps than the other one. Setsuna first weakens it with Ryoma's dual strike, making sure that she switches him to a weapon that can't crit first. Azama shifts the general, as well as serving the purpose of moving off the space to the right of Hana. Now that the spot to the right of Hana is free, Corrin is able to go there and trade Hana the Armor Slayer. After that, he uses the Dragon Vein to drop every enemy in this room's HP down by 10. That HP drop allows Hana to kill the general without having to risk a lethal hit. Ryoma body blocks the upper choke point to make sure the general can't pick off any of my weakened units. Sakura and Hinoka will go near them to apply their auras. Do? 
Setsuna goes to the right of where Saiza will weaken the general, since she's no longer needed on the right side. Now that the general is down to 1 HP, I have Orochi kill with Kaden's dual strike again. In the process of this, they both start heading closer to Daniela as well. I have to say, I'm getting really tired of these level ups. Azamba moves forwards to deal chip damage to the general. Whoever he dual strikes with doesn't matter here, since either way, this will put the general in range to get one shot by Hana. Ryoma pairs up with Felicia to move out of the way for Hana. Felicia now moves in range of the hero and is going to drop Ryoma down. Felicia is barely able to survive the incoming attack from the hero without the use of Sakura's aura, so I instead give the aura spot to Hinoka. Staying on the right side, Corrin is able to pair up with Silas this turn. Silas has enough movement to be able to drop Corrin in range of the Outlaw who will dual strike with the Berserker. This is what Sakura will be helping out with. The scary part about fighting the Berserkers on enemy phase is the fact that you need to either have enough luck to avoid the Berserker's crit chance, or enough defense to survive the crit. Since the Berserker gets his damage cut in half from the dual strike, Corrin is bulky enough to survive a dual strike crit very handily. Kicking things off with Corrin's side, I have him weaken the Berserker with the Godachi for a massive 19 damage, which will allow Silas to finish it off with any attack. I was very tempted to use the Brass Naginata to let Corrin get more sword experience, but I figured that it wasn't worth risking death for. Hana moves forwards to chip the hero with Felicia's dual strike. This will guarantee that Felicia can kill the hero without having to rely on the slightly inaccurate dual strikes of Ryoma. More importantly, doing that allows Felicia to perfectly reach D rank in swords on the final enemy she will face on this map. Hinoka pairs up with Mozu, and then Mozu will transfer Hinoka to Tsubaki so she can be dropped in range of the unpromoted mercenary to fight on enemy phase with Tsubaki. Let's do this. Setsuna and Saizo go just barely outside of range of the outlaw for now. Need my help? Again? Please 
remain calm. I want to have Corrin start heading towards the other Dragon Veins next turn. To help with this, Azama will go in a spot where Silas can transfer Corrin to him, as well as Azama being able to reach the Dragon Vein. Ryoma goes in range of Daniela while holding the Kodachi to get one last fight in before the map closes out. Hinoka unfortunately needs to get healed here since she barely doesn't survive the next enemy phase without it, so I have Sakura get transferred over to her to fix this problem. Now that she's healed, Hinoka goes in range of the Berserker, who she can safely fight on this phase thanks to the Berserker having zero crit on Hinoka. Since the Berserker has a valid target, Setsuna can go in range of the Outlaw to take care of him on the next enemy phase safely. As I mentioned last turn, Korin will go to one of the Dragon Veins this turn by pairing up with Silas and then having Silas transfer Korin to Azama where he'll be able to reach one. I do want to have Hinoka kill the Berserker instead of Tsubaki, but having to hit both a 96 and a 90 isn't exactly comfortable at this point in the run. That's where the third and final Dragon Vein comes in. After Korin uses it, the Berserker will be dropped down to 3 HP, meaning only one of the two hits have to connect. This makes my odds of success very good. Now all that's left is Daniela. In order to achieve maximum hit rates against her, I have her surrounded by a unit on each of her four sides, and use Rally Luck as well. Unfortunately, this still creates a hit rate that is less than ideal for the final hit of the run, but uh... YOLO? That was awful, but I'm finally glad we peeled this band-aid off. See you next time.